Thank y'all so much for having us today. Um, just like my fellow colleagues have already gone into to depth about how they're using drones with uh, the GIS applications. Uh, I'm gonna try to loosely uh, not get as technical, but kind of give you a use case of how the DOT is taking all of these forms of technology and actually implementing it on our live mitigation projects that we're having uh, with, with the DOT. So I wanted to get brief on and talk with y'all on the UAVs and coastal monitoring and how we're using that and how they apply to our mitigation planning process. And so I'm Wes Cartner, I'm with the NCDOT. Uh, I'm in the environmental analysis unit. Uh, while I wanna talk to you today about our, our Phragmites modeling and the Body Island Lighthouse mitigation project, we have also had other successful experiences using UAVs and therefore the GIS applications that come with them uh, for other environmental uh, inspection applications, such as our wetland predictive modeling, where we're using the same LIDAR systems you've already heard about. Uh, we are also using the WingTRA platform back there for our bald eagle nest surveys. Uh, and we're also still using some of the, the same thermal data that we're tracking to see what is the ultimate value of it over a period of time, but we're using those thermal images to track bats uh, for some of our bridge projects. Uh, as well as the red caucated woodpecker habitat modeling. We, uh, Carrie and myself, have also found ourselves on top of a man lift in the middle of a, a 400 acre preserve, uh, trying to maintain visual line of sight of our platform. So you, you do what you have to do to make sure the, the job works. And so I wanted to start off with just kind of a, a, a broad area map to show you this is the Outer Banks of North Carolina, uh, the National Seashore. Um, this is a, an isolated location for all intent and purpose. So what you can see is obviously almost more water than land in our given location, meaning less resources for us to actually deploy on our site. So we're trying to make the best of what we have to offer uh, in this general area. And so a little bit of background on the, the, the Body Island project. How did we get there? Why Body Island? Uh, Body Island is part of our project commitments that we needed to satisfy for the B2500, as DOT calls it, uh, but the Bonner Bridge replacement, uh, now known as the Mark Bassanite Bridge in the Outer Banks. Uh, it is a long uh, concrete girder box, one of the third largest, I believe, in North America, but also the largest bridge project in the state of North Carolina, uh, going over the Oregon Inlet and NC-12. Um, notorious for flooding, notorious for uh, having evacuation issues. So the new bridge was supposed to alleviate uh, some of those, those problems. Uh, out at the Outer Banks, as you can remember from the first picture, there's not a lot of land there to begin with. So when DOT wanted to put this three mile bridge out there, they knew that they were going to impact roughly, uh, I believe it was a quarter, if not a half acre of camel wetlands. And so to get the mitigation for the permit to make sure that this bridge goes through, we were left holding the bag of where do we get this mitigation that we have to put back in the same area that we're putting our project. Uh, so we followed up with the National Park Service. Uh, the National Park Service and the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program came together and they basically deemed the Body Island Lighthouse uh, an area of significant cultural resource. And so they wanted to protect that site and rehabilitate that site to not uh, destroy any further or degradate the uh, natural biodiversity that uh, occurs on that site. And so back in 2011, we originally, NCDOT, mapped almost 50 acres, approximately 50 acres of the invasive breed of Phragmites. Uh, and just a little bit of background on Phragmites, I don't know if anybody else has, has worked with it. Uh, it's an invasive species of reed. Uh, it can grow up to 10 plus feet in height, in canopy height, whereas our natural vegetation found out there is much less than that, you know, six feet and less. So when we get full canopy height stands of Phragmites, mature Phragmites, it is essentially covering out and cutting out all the natural vegetation and degrading those, those resources. So how do we address the invasive species of reed Phragmites? We used or we deployed an adaptive mitigation or an adaptive management plan. And what exactly is an adapted, adaptive management plan? And it was essentially us coming to the National Park Service saying, you have a problem we are going to work to address it, but we don't know what that's going to look like. So we're going to make an effort and we are going to have learning processes along the way. And hopefully by the end of it or through the, the continuation of the monitoring of it, we are improving the future management. So this allows us to take 
uh, those, those risks. And uh, like uh, Travis was talking about, the R&D of it. We don't know if we have the best tool. There's no golden wrench. There's no golden tool to, to uh, address all of these um, issues out there. So what do we have in our tool belt that we can actually use uh, to address this? And so as, as GIS professionals and uh, coming back to what are your client needs, uh, these were the three success criteria that we essentially were, we arrived at for the, the B2500 and how are we going to address the, the control of this Phragmites. And so the three criteria were essentially from the first year that we modeled it. So in 2011, there was approximately 50 acres. And then when I took over this project back in 2019, we had gone upwards to 55 to 60 acres and then insert uh, the COVID pandemic and the national ban on Chinese manufacturing drones that put us uh, behind the eight ball trying to find a new Blue UAS approved platform that we could fly at the Park Service because of you, as you've already heard, National Park Service doesn't like any, any type of drone. Doesn't matter if it's a Chinese drone or an American drone, they prefer you just not to have it. So there were extra hoops to jump through to make sure that not only did we have a Blue AS list approved drone, but that we could fly it and do what we needed to do within the National Park Service. Um, so mapping the acreage, proving that it is decreasing over the, the beginning of the project to the end. We want to make sure that we can continue that the trend after treatment continues to decrease as well. And then ultimately one of our end goals is to obtain a canopy height of three feet or less for the majority of the stands left. Um, so we started with roughly 60 acres. And so one of the success criteria is 10 acres or less. So we have our work cut out for us. Um, but then the remaining 10 acres, we're trying to aim to get three feet or less. So how are we gonna do that? Uh, and just for a quick reference, uh, you'll see a, a map here in the next couple slides that, that has where all of these vegetation plots actually occur. But we want to be, basically be able to say the image on the left represents 10% coverage of Phragmites for that general area. And what we are trying to do is basically revisit these same vegetation plots and we want to track that percentage. And by these vegetation plots, we can repeat monitor with those GPS locations, and we can measure this percentage over the course of the monitoring project. So you have 10% coverage on the left, and you have 70, approximately 70% 70 coverage of Phragmites on the right. So much less green. You can begin to see a lot of the, uh, the plume, the feather plume of the, the Phragmites in, in the brown on that right-hand side. And so how did we end up at drones for this project? Uh, like I mentioned, it is the Outer Banks of North Carolina. It's on the coast. Uh, it is a very isolated location. We could not get a manned crew to come out and even bid the project because it's also not a 400 acre project, an 800 acre project. It's a 60 acre project. So it's 60 acres of highly valuable and very you know heavily protected species of acreage that we're trying to address and we can't just blanket aerial pesticide applicate from the traditional manned uh, methods uh, there were also site restrictions that we needed to consider uh, there is a high power transmission line that runs parallel to the site and so while aerial pesticide you have to come in high to get low to minimize your drift there was no safe angle of approach for traditional manned methods to access this site. Uh, we also had multiple species uh, that were either state protected, state threatened, or of concern vegetation, wildflower species at the site that also we would not be able to ensure that we were protecting them and keeping them from being sprayed if we were to utilize a traditional uh, manned method. Uh, National Park Service also was very adamant about not degrading any further the acreage that they already have. So they were very worried about having mechanized clearing or any type of mechanized operation coming out into the swamp. It is a swamp. It is not stable. You put anything of weight in there and you are going to be making tracks, destroying more than you're actually trying to help. So they didn't want us to put actual boots on the ground, men in the, in the actual Phragmites, cutting it down and removing it because we also had further research that said the more you put disturbance uh, into the Phragmites stands, the more that they tend to spread when you're shaking off the shoots and whatnot. 
So we couldn't get in it with hands on the ground. We couldn't use man, traditional manned methods either. Um, and we, the National Park Service was also very concerned about the optics to the tourism, the tourists that were coming to the National Seashore. When people come to North Carolina, yes, they wanna see the Outer Banks. Yes, they wanna see the lighthouse. They don't want to see an aerial pesticide herbicide applicator coming in and spraying pesticides on the, the lighthouse grounds. So that was immediately ruled out. Uh, and the National Park Service has now seen us in and as very much more uh, on board with what we're doing. And that is also kind of addressing your, your client needs. What does your client need? And these were some of the things that we had to take uh, into consideration before we could come up with our, our plan. And so I, I'll, you see this list and I will come back to it. Uh, the, the next few images kind of just attest to these bullet points and why we could not do it uh, traditional methods. But now that we've gotten all the vegetables out of the way, let's get to the fun part. There we go. Maybe. I had a video here. There we go. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to do this completely backwards. I'm going to show you the finished project first, and then we're going to go back and figure out how we got there and show you all the different building blocks. Um, back to having the correct tool in your tool belt for a project. Uh, this is the National Park Service. We had to have Blue UAS drone approved. Uh, while DJI manufactured drones are great, and we did love them, we had an agris on this project beforehand. Given the rules and the regulations, we were no longer allowed to use our agris about three years ago. Um, so we had to research R&D, find a new platform. And so this is our Helios AG-110. Uh, and this is manufactured in the US uh, from a company, uh, Helios, out in Texas. And so we've had this platform for two, going on three years now. Um, and we are also using one of the Skydio X2s to film uh, this application. Uh, it's a little bit more gritty than I anticipated. I apologize, but you should be able to see um, most of the, the droplets coming out as it's, as it's spraying through. Um, and this just gives you a representation of the open body of water, the significant and established tree line that we have. It's kind of behind you right there. You can't see it just yet, but some of the site features and uh, things that we needed to navigate around through there. So I wanted to, to reiterate, you can see the isolation, the scale of this, this area. There was no safe place or no applicable place for a private or commercial aerial herbicide uh, applicator to, to stage any of their operations. Um, there were, we are also in the Cherry Point MCAS uh, airspace. So not only did we have to get drones that were on the blue UAS list, we also had to seek a COA that allowed us to navigate in the national airspace within the MCAS area. Uh, so that's, that's also one of the things that Mr. Matt was talking about, that you need to be able to plan these flights in advance, look at your airspace, make sure you're not walking out, uh, flying your drone into a wall or flying your drone into military airspace. They don't, they don't like that very much and they'll let you know about it. Uh, so here is our, our end game and what GIS and UAVs bring us uh, on our Body Island project. Uh, our red polygon is essentially our project boundary. You can see that it encompasses about 142 acres, whereas our blue uh, polygon is our UAS treatment area. And so you can also see our vegetation points. Uh, the, those were the 10% the and the 70% uh, pictures that I showed you earlier. This, is, this goes into our monitoring efforts and we keep track uh, with these GPS locations. We can take the same Skydio X2 back to this direct point every year when we're flying and we can nadir down and take that same picture every year. And we can just have that repeatable evidence and the, the repeatable results. Um, and we were able to get this blue polygon by flying it with not only RGB imagery, but also the multi-spectral imagery. 
So as you have already heard, the Wingtra is a wonderful platform. Uh, you have multiple payloads that can go inside of it. We use not only the Sony XR1 that has the 42 megapixels, that was our first flight, but we also use what's called a Micasense Red Edge that gives us multispectral data. And this allows us to measure vegetation health. And so we needed to be able to get vegetation health to figure out where our Phragmites stands were growing in the most populous regions. So therefore we could then delineate them and make sure we are specifically spraying those with our drone. And so we have, you, ha you can see the Micasense Red Edge in the, in the belly of the, the wing chair right there. Um, five bands that take the same picture just in a different uh, spectrum. And so you can uh, compress and composite all of those into one image. And so while yes, there are multiple programs and softwares that you can always post process through drone deploy is the easiest one and so here's what a drone deploy output at i believe four inch resolution gives you uh on this 60 acre uh site out at the body island and so lessons learned uh i will i, I have less experience in the post processing world uh, they usually send me out there to spray and that's i i can spray i'm, I'm your field guy so uh yours truly carrie mapes in the back she does a lot of our post processing for us and so she uses pix 4d and she makes all of our data look really good in that regards um we did set control for this did we need it not to the level we weren't design grade building anything on this but uh, like Travis said, it's better to have a not need than to need not have. And if you're going to do it, you might as well do it right. So yes, we set control uh, for this project. Uh, here's just a, a, a visual of 42 megapixel, four inch resolution output at 350 feet in the air at uh, AGL uh, when, we, when we flew this. And so that is the observation deck out at Body Island. And then here, if you can see in the middle, right there in the sand, we have our control point set. Um, and I believe we ended up setting about six control points um, due to poor planning on my part. We only were able to capture four of those control points in our actual imagery. Did that impact our RMSE XY? Not necessarily. We were still within the 10th on both our RGB and our multispectral data, but my Y RMSD for the, the RGB was a little bit higher than we anticipated, but we were still within the 0.2 to 2.5, I believe, RMSE of the vertical accuracy uh, or Z accuracy on the multi-spec. And so here you can see the RGB from drone deploy on the left, uh, given our monitoring report. And in the purple, you can see what we originally delineated back in 2019 from our Phragmites model. And so the black polygons you can see here is where the, the 50 acres that DOT originally mapped. And then in the purple, you can see when we came back and flew it again in 2019, how that really coincided with the same polygons that we already had. And then on the right side, you can see what we flew this past year, 2022, the Micasense Red Edge output for the Body Island Project. And so this is to help you measure vegetation health and whatnot. And so it will gather that reflectance signature when we isolate it in the model for the frag. And so here, just like what Trevor was saying, with multi-spec, you still get data sinks in, in the water. So that's why that is completely red, as is the parking lot. But you can really see, if, if I were to able to zoom in, you would be able to see with much more detail uh, those vegetation features in that image. And so what do we do with that data? Here is where we can now overlay both our RGB flight and our multi-spec flight. And with our change detection, because we are monitoring this site almost to perpetuity, but continually every year until we meet our success rate, we are able to change and monitor where do we have frag now? Where did we have frag last year? What has changed to and what has changed from? And so this, this relies heavily on the data that you do acquire and lessons learned. Uh, I accidentally used two different flight plans, one for RGB and one for multi-spec. We had to come out there two different flights. So like they said, you have a different tool in your belt for every project. And you may have that tool in your office and you may have to buy another tool with the same serial number just so you can go use that tool. We had a Wingtra Gen 1 with a red edge we only had a mount 
for the Red Edge sensor for a Wingtra Gen 2. So we could not get our sensors and our platforms to play ball, even though they are the same thing. And so lessons learned, you need to make sure that you have your sensor and it's appropriate uh, device mount for your platform to be able to utilize those correctly. Um, and so here's a close up on the actual delineation, the black, the original DOT fragmented delineation from 2011, and then the model results from 2022. And so we, I got the data for the multi-spec a little bit later in the flowering season. So the vegetation health, our model was queued up to analyze for Phragmites in the beginning of its flowering stages. And we got out there and we're getting data probably a week or two after the pre-flight of the, the pre-emergence window that we wanted. So this data isn't as accurate as we'd like for it to be, but it's still, it gets across the point that this is where the Phragmite still is, but our data that we wanted to get, the model of it, when you post-process, it would have been uh, much more accurate had we been able to get it in that, that res uh, respective reflectance window. And so here you can see our original polygon that we delineated for the whole site. And how does that transpose into actually getting it sprayed uh, with herbicide? And so the picture on the left is the original uh, aerial photograph that we had from Bonner Bridge from DOT and then the original NC DOT delineation. And we took that one large shape file and were able to transpose it directly into the Agrisol flight planning software. Uh, so just like the DJI, very easy to navigate, very easy to fly. It also has uh, essentially an autopilot feature. So while yes, most of these drones have controllers that you need sticks to fly, just like the Wingtra where it's only a pad and you program that mission and it goes and does that mission. This aerial pesticide applicator also runs in that same capacity. You take your predetermined delineated shape files and you can take that shape file or KML and put it directly into the, the, the software and it will create its own flight plan for you. So you're only as accurate as your shape files are, but we were able to take that one large file and break it down into about 10 different areas. And so from shape file to flight plan, all of our flight planning software is essentially a large GIS in, in and amongst itself. Uh, we take the shape file, we can take a KML um, or a KMZ and upload it directly in there. And that's how we were taking our project from start to finish, uh, starting with the GIS of the delineated Phragmites to create the flight plans to treat it. And so one more step, uh, we have used the same flight plans, not only for the Wingtra to collect the, the data on the front end with the RGB and the multi-spec, we use the same flight plans for the Helios, the, uh, the herbicide sprayer, and we will use that same GPS located flight plan again for yet another platform that has uh, what's called a, uh, it's for a prescribed burn. The US Forest Service has an M600 uh, with a controlled burn. Uh, it's not a sensor, I forget how you wanna call it, but they essentially drop ping pong balls called dragon eggs that will initially or initiate a fire. And so we're going to use the same flight plans to come through and drop these controlled burning balls along our mature tree line that we can't get close enough to with our drone to hopefully burn up the biofuel that we have out there. Um, that's been one of the, the hard steps working with the, the National Park Service. Um, they received the, the go ahead back in 2012 to burn this area, but things and safety plans and time have just not allowed us to get out there and do that. But that is one thing that we do think will will very much uh, excel this project and how we will meet our uh, adaptive mitigation planning needs. And so just in summary, uh, why drones in GIS is repeatable, it's accurate and it's efficient. Uh, once we were able to go in and have our original flights, it took probably 40 minutes each uh, in field and then probably two hours of post-processing for your colored imagery, your RGB, and your multispectral to have those ready to go uh, to be post-processed post into the next session. Um, so yes, while Carrie will tell you, there was probably a whole lot, many more days that went into massaging that data. Oh, can you do this? Oh, can you clean up that? It is the nature of the beast. It will always happen. 
but we have repeatable results. We know that they are accurate within reason. We're going to learning um, with additional learning, we're going to put back out more error points this year and make sure that all of our flight plans encompass the same area. That way we can alleviate some of the black holes that we had in our, in our data last year. Um, the efficiency of it, we can take our herbicide sprayer and we can address almost seven acres an hour. Uh, I don't know how many strict environmentalists we have in the room that have ever put on a Tyvek suit and a backpack sprayer and have had to walk through a coastal marsh spraying pesticide and herbicide an acre an hour walking through in that heat is probably not fun. Seven acres an hour for a person is just not feasible. Uh, we were able to take 60 acres uh, from a previous consultant that took two and a half weeks to do it. And we were able to do this 60 acre project in about two and a half days. Uh, so at seven acres an hour with given the, the good weather and easy transitions, you are able to just roll with, with, with the repeatability of this project. Um, and the safety, uh, not having to put people boots on the ground. I don't like snakes, I don't like ticks. I love the woods, but I don't like snakes and ticks. And I don't wanna go traversing through a coastal marsh spraying pesticide if I don't have to. So if you mean to tell me I can launch from underneath a, a power line and fly my drone and address the same 60 acres without having to carry a backpack sprayer, I'm probably gonna be more inclined to do it that way. And because it's the National Park Service, it's never any fun unless you're breaking the law. So. Be sure to make sure you have your, your clearances to be out there, but also in the name of science, it's for the government. That's all I have for that. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We're in the process of updating our MTP or doing our new MTP. And mm -hmm. one of the issues that we have is in regard to our confront conformity. Mm -hmm. um, has the NCDOT utilized drones um, in order to um, monitor air quality? And um, it's before my time of starting with the MPO, but it's my understanding that a stationary air quality monitor was set up um, in our MPO right over uh, 64. Okay. I'm wondering if there has been a usage for drones to do an air quality monitoring that would be more broad across the MPO to help um, the MPOs meet conformity uh, standards and I objectives. I am unaware of any use case of, of an air quality aspect with drones at this point in time, uh, but that's that's not necessarily on the on the side of the house that I deal with. I'm I'm, I'm less noise and air and more environment and mitigation. So I'd, I'm just not familiar with that if that is out there at this time. Good morning. My name is Eric Funderburk and I'm with Guilford County GIS. I'm a GIS analyst. Had a couple of technical questions there. Um, how do you capture the control points? Do you go out in the 60 acres with a uh, we had an R10, we had a triple R10. So NCDOT location and surveys, Mark Ward came out with us. Uh, and this is the same control that's been set on this site uh, from the beginning. Uh, we went out and located those and put down our control panels. Um, I think we have six on the site. Um, and due to the changing of the site, some of them, uh, we had vegetation overgrowth that from where we were standing, we thought we were going to be able to pick them up. They looked good on the ground, but then from the flight line, they were just covered by the overhanging vegetation. But yes, we did go out there uh, with the Trimble R10 and, and locate all of our GPS. And did you do it yourself as a, as a licensed surveyor? No, sir. Okay. All right. Um, M Mark Ward is our certified PE in that, or PLS in that capacity, and I've is I he, helped him. Is he a GIS analyst? I'm just curious because mm -hmm. I, I have a, I, I hold a PLX. Yes, sir. Because of a uh, little deal they had back in 2014 where the GIS people could apply. Right. Uh, just curious on that. A uh, couple other questions you mentioned. Um, um, I was curious as, as how what is the altitude that you spray at when you spray. So typically we fly at 12 to 15 feet above the canopy height. And so our platform also has obstacle avoidance sensors on it. Um, so in the lower left and lower right uh, is, our, is our Helios AG-110. 
Um, on the lower left image, you can see right there on the left side of that tank is a little black box. We have three optical avoidance sensors, one on the front, one on the back, and one on the bottom of that pesticide applicator. And so when you're, or herbicide applicator, and the name of the game when you're dispensing those types of materials is minimizing drift. So we want to be as low and close to the canopy height as we can. And so those obstacle avoidance sensors allow us to basically follow the terrain while understanding that we're looking at our canopy and we think that that's at about five to six foot high, our drone will stay about four to five feet high above that. So we average about 12 to 15 foot AGL flying over our plots. Okay, thank you very much. And one more question. Yes, one sir. More. Yeah. I'm sorry, I won't Late take up all the time. One more, one more. Um, we mentioned four inch resolution. Yes, sir. Does that mean that the pixels yes. are four inch? Yeah, exported from drone deploy at four inch resolution per pixel, yes. Oh man, that's, that's awesome. I and believe then, I have that correct, if anybody wants to. And and the PIX 4D person is in the, in the house? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Miss Carrie Mapes in the, in the back row. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hey, Wes, I have a question here for you right here. Yes, sir. Uh, so how, how big is the reservoir for the herbicide? How much do you guys put in a gallons? Or? It is a 10-liter, three-gallon tank. So we average 0.91 acres per flight. And so now, yes without getting in the weeds of it, we could probably get to 0 0.95, 0 0.94. When you're pumping that pesticide through the tank, you don't wanna run that system dry. When you induce air into that system, it basically starts making all of your jets spit. So you're not getting an appropriate coverage. So we have a 10 liter, three gallon tank. We know that we have set every flight line or every polygon to spray 0.91 acres every time we launch, then we refill change the battery. That way we're bringing it back with just enough liquid that we're not wasting the trip, but we're also keeping the system primed and we can just refill the tank and the battery and just go. It takes about a minute and a half of a, of a pit crew okay. to land it and launch it again for the next flight. And how long is the flight? Usually we average anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so, if I can get back to um, one of the images at the beginning, uh, the furthest point. So the reason, one of the reasons why we were able to do uh, this project in two and a half days was because we were able to push the limits of the system. We are currently launching from NC-12 or the, the power line of NC-12 and we are flying this platform loaded with a battery and 10 liters of, of pesticide still under 55 pounds. We're flying it at 2,400 feet away, going down, spraying our acre, coming back up to a 30 foot altitude and coming back to our location another quarter mile back. So we're flying a half mile and spraying 0.91 acres all in about 10 to 12 minutes. Yes, sir. Um, hey, I'm Justin, Bell JP Engineering. Yes, sir. Um, my question is more on the mechanics of how you're um, how you're dispensing um, the herbicide. Yes, sir. So, first of all, is this when you're when you're dispensing the herbicide? Is this a controlled flight plan, a pre-plan? Okay. And as that flight plan is going on, are you mechanically controlling dynamic the release? flow rate? Uh, so this this platform is why it blows. <laughs> the, there's the DJI Agris, which is what we came from, and then there's this, and this is the Agris is a dinosaur. Uh, there were so many problems with that. You can ask Chris Dustin about that. Um, okay. Dynamic flow rate. So that is the function of how high is your drone flying? What is your swath width? How far apart are your flight lines? So we typically try to cover... 15 feet from left to right with our drone per flight line. So how high, how far, and how fast are you moving determines how much liquid is actually being dispensed. So with the dynamic flow rate that you can set in the flight plan, per the manufacturer specs, we try to apply three gallons per acre. So that is of the mixture of the 64-64-1 of Habitat and Aquapro. So we're making that mixture at three gallons per acre our drone calculates its own speed. So when we go to launch it and we get it to in a safe place, 
we can essentially go to the autopilot and click resume and it flies to its last waypoint, right? And it drops down to start doing its mission. We tell it, we would like for you to fly at 10 miles an hour. Well, that's, that's a static speed, but the environment itself is never static. You have cross draft, you have wind, you have obstacle avoidance that kicks in and slows down the drone. So as that drone is speeding up, stopping, slowing, speeding up, it is calculating within itself, I need to maintain three gallons per acre. I need to spray more, I need to spray less, I need to spray more. And so there is also a feature as we're watching the drone fly. So yes, we're monitoring the GPS location of our drone. We can also monitor the battery life uh, in the actual software and we can monitor that application rate. Um, it's got a little circle on it, lights up green, red or black. Green, you're in the good, red, you're not doing anything, black, you're not spraying at all. So we can sit there and watch our drone navigate its obstacles at 10 miles an hour and still maintain our three gallon uh, per acre application rate. That, that's amazing. And I wasn't even thinking about the flight changing based on the flow rate, which is also mm -hmm. amazing in itself. More, I was wondering when you get near formations that you don't want to spray on or near, is it, is it willing to avoid that? So yeah, I'm sure there, was, there were water bodies nearby, not just the ocean surrounding it, that you didn't want well, so we, we were on the sound side. So NC-12 Ocean was on, okay. was on our east, and we were on the, the sound side. So not necessarily that, but that's where our ship files came into. Um, there might be some dendritic water features on the, the south end of the property, but that's not where we're spraying. So we weren't worried about spraying over those. But the, the herbicides that we are spraying are aquatic approved. So we're not worried about them getting into the water, but no, we are not flying directly over the open water either. Our shape files control the flight plan. Yeah. And so when we delineated it, we basically could say, mm, water, we're not, we're not flying over open water. We're not dispensing our pesticides into the open water. Okay. So for this case, you didn't have to worry too much about it, but if in another case you could account for that. Yes. Okay. Awesome. All, all in where your, your flight plan goes. Yes, sir. Um, did you have any worries about like the, I guess the downforce from any of your platforms spreading or causing any more spread of the Phragmites while you guys were out there? Uh, not really. Uh, this, this platform is, is very great at minimizing prop wash. Um, now, so this was their, their generation one, this was their first, uh, platform. And so, as you can see, we do have our, our booms that go off to the side and dispense directly down. Uh, the Agris platform had its booms underneath the props. And so I, I haven't, I haven't gone back and, and watched specifically. There's no, there's no research, so to speak of which style is any better. Um, but Helios has now in their new model moved to putting their prop or their booms underneath their props as well. And so typically we find when you're watching it, as long as there's no strong cross draft, you can see that mist go directly down. And most of the time, the props are actually pushing it down as opposed to stirring it up. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? All right, thank you all so much.